just put those zones in now where you can blow up, but All right. no. Uh, so we're just gonna we're gonna start with a little bit about we'll start with your you know a little bit about your childhood and then we'll kind of work our way through. Um, if there are any stories, I know you you have a lot of information. If there's anything that you think that you know we definitely should know, and I'm not asking a question about it, feel free to say I got a story for you, and we'll you know love to hear it. I don't know too many stories. Some of them might not be true. <laughs> That Jay Moore used to tell. That's okay. We, you know, we'll listen to them all, and then if I, if I find it to be uncredible, I'll, oh, I'll, Lord. I'll, I'll edit it out later. Um, so let's start with, uh, if you could tell us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about your childhood. Okay, Mary Howell, and I was born and brought up in Germantown. I graduated from high school in 53. And then I was basically gone for 20 years, because then I moved back in 73. My husband and I split up. My parents gave me land down on County Route 6. And I built a house, and then eventually I realized that house was too much for me. So I sold that and looked around for something I could afford, and I built this one. What was it? And her father built both houses. What, what was it like to, uh, to no, grow up? Yeah. What was it like to grow up in Germantown? Well, I had a very boring life, I think, because we lived on a farm, and maybe like Nadine and some of the others, I don't know. She lived closer to the village. See, I was closer to Claremont, really. I knew more what was going in Claremont. We only lived a mile from there, because our place was right in that point. You know, where Germantown goes down, Claremont was on both sides of us. But, you know, in the summer we worked on the farm. That was all picked fruit. We had strawberries, you know, and then peaches, apples, cherries, all nine yards. Were you? And, okay. No, that was all potatoes in the fall. Daddy would plow them up in the it during the day and as soon as we came home from school changed our clothes out and picking up potatoes now they have machines that do it all yeah so was that did that take up most of your time that wasn't spent uh, in school was was the farm yeah at night oh we'd go into Dale's bridge not the bridge that's there now the other one and swim in there and you know like with other kids and all and but I, I was I was too young but I was big physically big so nobody knew how young I was but I started in a one-room schoolhouse down on County Route 6 by the Werner farm and the teacher I guess boarded with us although I can't remember him he turned out to be gay. And in those days, that was a no-no. And, well, this is one you can cut out. Put the make on our hired man. <laughs> Daddy fired him on the spot. <laughs> well, then he had to go get another teacher. But because I was so bad and devilish at home, Mr. Shealy said, oh, I'll take her on to school with me, don't worry. Well, then the next year we centralized in Germantown, with Germantown, and they should have kept me back in first grade because I don't remember a blasted thing about elementary school, not a thing. I was, two, I was always at least two years younger than anybody else. All the way through to the end of college, I was always two years younger, yeah? Because I was 16, I was 15 when I was a senior, and of course I signed up for driver training, and I learned to drive and change tires, all those things you did back then. And then one day, uh, Mr. Mortensen, the principal, he came to me, he said, Mary, he said, you can't take driver training anymore. I said, why? He said, you're not old enough for a permit. Well, heck, by that time I knew how to drive, I didn't have to bother. <laughs> No. 
but now they don't have driver training at all, which I think is a mistake. And uh, I graduated when I was 16, had no idea. I just assumed I'd be a nurse like my sister, but I would have to go back another year because I wasn't old enough to get into a hospital for training. You had to be 17. So we had no guidance counselors in those days like they do now to help kids figure out colleges and all. Our guidance counselor was Mr. Martinson, the principal, and you were allowed 10 minutes. And everyone went down and sat in that chair and looked at them and said, now Mary, what's your plans for next year? And so I told them, come back, take science courses. He said, you know, you like home ec. You like Mrs. Ryder. You do very well in home ec. Well, who wouldn't? But anyway, he said, have you ever thought about being a home ec teacher? I said, no. He said, well, go home, talk it over with your parents. So that's how I got to be a teacher. And I started, I was trained and started out for a home ec teacher. Taught that two years up in the Adirondacks in North Creek, where Gore Mountain Ski Area is. And when I got married and moved down to South Jersey, they didn't need a home ec teacher, couldn't find a job, but one little school needed a fourth grade teacher. So I needed a job. And that was that. I went to school down to Glassboro, to Rutgers, any place where I could pick up courses I needed. I certified. Then we, after four years or so, we came back to North Creek and there was a fourth grade opening. Can you believe that? And I got it. And I just was in fourth grade ever since. I guess, I think when I moved back from Colorado, there, because my husband, he was in Brazil and there was no sense in the girls and I staying out there. So, my parents were getting older. Somebody was going to have to watch for them. And so, I came back home and got a fourth grade job here. It just was meant for me to do fourth grade, I guess. And then it wasn't too long. I think I might have done fifth grade two years till a fourth grade opened up. And then the state said, oh, you got to teach a local history. And I didn't know it, but I learned it. Man, I learned it. I hit Walt Miller and uh, I just found out I loved it. You know, I just, that was it. Then it came the county's big celebration and Lena Mink was historian in Livingston she had Alzheimer's. She couldn't do much. So every fourth grade was supposed to do an exhibit at the college in every town. Well, Livingston didn't have anybody that could do it. So I volunteered, you know, if somebody would help me. So my kids in school, we ended up, we had four booths all together. Because the mine, I mean, I grew up here in did anybody tell you about the burden mines that were here? There was a whole village just down the road where that sign is. There were three roads that went back. And the first house in, it's a little gray house. Awful nice kids from New York own it. And there were three rooms up and down. There were two family houses. And then every few houses shared an outdoor toilet. They pipe water from what they call the locky way back up that way. And all the pipes are there. And that came down. Then they had pumps, you know. And it must have been something. They had a store. The store was right out in back of my turnabout in there. The foundation is still there. Everybody wants those stones, but they're history, so I won't let them go. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, down over the hill is uh, mine number two that caved in one noontime. The men were out, but the mules all got killed. No, they had four mines. The last one was what's now Iron Mountain. Yeah. The first one was over across the road in back of the Scroden place. So that was the first thing I really got into because there were a, just a handful of people left that knew something about the mine. And my kids in school, they built the little houses, you know, and we had maps and they did a really, really good job. And uh, then it went on from there. And I, I taught 36 years altogether. And I retired in 93 and I went back that fall to sub. And it was fourth grade. That's why I took that day. And you know, we were doing maps, something with maps. Well, I remembered all the maps that I, because I had gone back that summer and cleaned out that whole file cabinet. Your mother would do that too. And be a son of a gun, I opened the file cabinet. Nothing. It was completely empty. Everything had been thrown away. I didn't bother subbing after that. Well, that and John Smith kept putting me in junior high and I knew I'd get in trouble there. No, no, all the language is terrible there. Mm -mm. No, and so by then I'm historian in Livingston, right? And that was fun. I knew nothing you can learn if you want to. Yep. And I'd take my kids, man, we'd go up to the deed, the county clerk's office, and different ones, you know, knew their house, and we'd look up their house in the deed books to see who had owned it, you know, and now they don't even take them to Claremont State Park at Christmas. Makes me mad. You know, all the history we've got right in this area. But back to when I, like when I was in high school, by now I know you know Lawler's was a hangout. But it wasn't a bad place. It was a good place. There was no drinking. There was no drugs. You know, if a girl wanted, was chasing some guy, you know, she figured he'd be at Lawler's. She'd find her way in there somehow. You know, and, um, uh, and you drank Coke, nothing else. And Ray would even let you read all the comic books. And then you put them back on the shelf or the magazines, you know, that one, you've seen pictures at one whole window. As you go in the door on the right were the comics and the magazines. And I had a jukebox and that, that was fun. That was a fun place to hang out, you know? But, um, and we put on our plays and, but there wasn't a lot of drinking. I had a brother that was the same, graduated with me. He was, his parents were dead and my parents took him from the orphanage when we were both in fourth grade. He went, he and I went all the rest of the school together. So he's told me some things once we got older that went on that I didn't know about. <laughs> so, but now he's out in San Diego. They, he was in the Navy and settled out in San Diego and been there ever since. Married the little girl next door. We all grew up together and Frank Hotelling, he was the star of the basketball team. No? And that was I don't follow the sports like I used to because I can't sit on the bleachers so I don't go to the games and plus I don't know any of the kids anymore but um, oh no everybody would go to the games and I don't know if they still do or not 
ask Donnie about that because he goes he goes to every game. He was in my class too. But we're losing a lot of them. Yeah. But we did a lot of things over my years of teaching in school. One and you never know. Like when you can cut any of this out. No, I'm this just, is all great. I'm yeah, just rambling great. here. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Uh, one one year, I had a girl, Kylin Freely. They lived just up on Maple Avenue. Her father has all those animals around. And Kylin's mother came in to drop off the key to the house. She had she was a latchkey kid. She had forgotten that her mother was a nurse. And they had friends down in the Amish country in Pennsylvania. Well, that was just before school started, around eight o'clock. That woman never left till noon time. That's why I'd never be able to teach now because, you know, I'm on the spur of the moment. Whatever we get into, that's where we stay. <laughs> Before she left, we had planned a trip for my whole class down to Pennsylvania. She had connection, and my daughters and I, I made them go with me one weekend. We went down. I lined everything up that the kids were going to see. And we raised every penny ourselves For the bus, we took a school bus. We went east of vacation. So school couldn't say no because I was prepared to buy my own insurance. And God bless old Eddie Hall. He was on the board then and he said, they sent me out in the hall, you know, for an executive session, but you could hear them. And Eddie says, I hope you know she's going to go no matter what we say. <laughs> so Mary Harder says, do you, do you remember Mary Harder? I, I never heard of such a thing, boys and girls in the same motel. Now, don't shut that off. If she only knew what her youngest daughter was doing, she wouldn't say that. But anyway, that's all right. <laughs> um, and she was with the gym teacher out on the river in a boat. But anyway, been a number of that going on in that school over the years. And nobody said anything. No. But anyway, we had some wonderful trip. We went five days. And those kids didn't have to bring a penny except for um, what they wanted to spend to bring home gifts. Every place we went was paid for, the motel was paid for, the meals were paid for, cost of the bus, everything was paid for. I had an extra bus driver in case something happened to the one. The mother went with me, she was a nurse. Mary Bartolotta went, remember the Spanish teacher, and I had a couple fathers go, Mr. Maroney went, and another man, and even before we went, I made up a whole booklet, I still have it, on how every subject would be covered, what they would learn pertaining to math and to language, and you know, that board got so many letters on what a wonderful class that was that went down. Yes? No? No. No, and they had enough money left that one Saturday we went out to uh, Rhode Island. Oh, where's the boat, the old whaling boat out there? No, Providence. I can't think now. That was a whole day. That was a long day. And then we went another Saturday out to Cooperstown, the Farmer's Museum. We raised a lot of money. We sold light bulbs by the case, and we had raffles. And so you can do things. You can raise money if you want to. And it makes me disgusted when I hear people, teachers say, no money. I have to buy my own pens. Well, my God, I bought pens for 36 years. What? <laughs> and pencils for the kids, so what? Mm -mm, I just was always thankful I ended up with teaching. I really was. 
and then when we got history going in Germantown, really, Walt Miller was wonderful. I'll tell you, Germantown owns a, owes a lot to Walt Miller. Oh, boy, boy, boy. He has done, he did, almost the history, the history of almost every church in this county. And he didn't get paid for doing that. Nowadays, everybody's got to get paid for everything they do. You know? No, Walt did so much. You no? Know? And, um, and pictures. And he took, he was, he was an unusual man. I, because when I got, took over County Historian, there was one in between. It was Hall and then Florence Mossman, but then she died, and then that's when I, because they knew I did a good job down here, so then they started tormenting me about the county. And they'd send all the letters of inquiry down to me. And so finally, that January, I said, well, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I'm there yet. No, but anyway, uh, Florence would not help anybody. It didn't matter if you were 99 years old from San Francisco. Nope, she had a form letter she'd send back that it was not her job. She just was to research businesses and the history and all that. But any place, like in Germantown, the people are what makes the history. So you got like Edgar DeWitt, okay? Now, I won't say that. Edgar's grandfather was a very, very important man. I think his father was pretty important. Edgar uh, was important with well drilling. But anyway, uh, and that Edgar's grandfather made the history of Sheridan. He really did. He had boats, he had tugboats, he had um, boats that carried cement from a, the uh, factories across the river over to people that needed it here. I mean, it was unbelievable. In fact, at one time, they owned all the land up to the Legion Hall. Yeah. Now you take the Legion Hall. That was a church. I guess you can tell from the way it looks, but that was a Me Methodist church. Yeah. I got pictures of it as a church. Yeah. Now, this book I'm doing, I'll tell you, I don't know how I'm ever going to pay for doing it. <laughs> And I'm gonna, I'm going to do it myself. I, I have to borrow the money because I don't want anybody telling me what can go in and what can't, you know? Because sometimes they don't know and they get it, they change something to it wrong. You gotta be careful, yeah. But I don't know, is that enough? <laughs> well, I have a couple questions for you. That was great. I but was, I didn't answer what you No, that was for. perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> uh, I just want to ask you a couple questions about um, the, you know, how the physical change of Germantown. It's, uh, you know, from how it looked when you were a kid or, you know, how the people were when you were a kid. You know, as you go through and then you left for, you said you left for 20 years and yeah. came back and what that difference was. Well, I'll tell you, when I came from the hill, mm -hmm. It wasn't as good as I remember it now. Neither were the houses as big as I thought they were. You know how it is when you're a kid, but uh, the drugstore, Van Vliet's drugstore was, I believe, closed. Uh, I'm not sure when Lawler, Ray Lawler was still alive when I moved back, but it wasn't the same. And like our road, County Route 6, it starts at Claremont, and goes all the way to 9J. Most of it's Claremont though, actually. Every house just about was a farm. And now you don't find any farms. 
my God, coming from Claremont, you had Frank Combs, you had the Stenics, you, my father, Barber, uh, Ed Wright. He not only had a farm, now he's, that's where the Fuchses all are now, okay? He also sold the packing material, the baskets to pack fruit and all that in. And then he went on down and you had Harry Slater's, you had Royden Lasher's, you had Werner's, and then the Rockefellers. They had Vernon, Minard, and Harold. Harold, you had three big Rockefeller farms. Joyce Rockefeller was the daughter-in-law of the last one. Yeah. And then you went on down until you came to the triangle there. And that used to be a garage. Did anyone tell you that? That was called the Triangle Garage. And Haltemann started that. Yeah. I got pictures, believe it or not, when they hit accidents there. You wouldn't think, would like in the 30s or so, that the cars could get that wrecked, but they did. Yeah. What about the... Um the, the little bit, the village of Germantown, um, from when you were a kid to, you know, what, like what I was said, the hustle and bustle down there? Well, Teddy Ginsburg had the, had the grocery store. That was busy. And then, I can't remember what was in Van Vliet's. Oh, Aunt Lipschutz had a, um, appliances in there at one time. They must have bought it from the Van Vliet's. Lawler's I, was still active. Then after Lawler's closed, for a little while there was a drugstore in there and that was really nice to have a drugstore in town. But I know they can't afford to have, you know, a mom and pop Oh my God, and this central house was terrible. Nice people didn't go anywhere near it. No. <laughs> I went in once with an auctioneer and I was so embarrassed. It was after school. I was embarrassed to go from my car into the central house because he was getting ready. I used to help an auctioneer, Tommy Tompkins. I used to help him. Uh, do auctions. I didn't get paid for that either. I just like to do it. And you're bored. No. Oh, okay. Uh, it was so awful to go in there. And yet that was the most up and coming place before Frida Steer was married. Probably in the 30s. Somebody else maybe can tell you closer. A lot of people came and spent the summer there from the city. And the women, they would get jobs packing fruits. A lot of them packed fruit over to Tinkapaws on Route 9. Or they'd work at tea houses. Oh, my God. Let me just... Mm. To take the microphone off if you see you. Yeah. Or if you want Sarah to hand it to you. Oh. This is private oh, caller. No, no worries. Uh, these guys had bought it to own it now. And that's why I hope that people from town support him and go there. Because he has put a lot of money into that place. And believe it or not, I don't know who built that yet. The only thing I can find out is it started out as a little, what we would call a dive or a dump or the worst mint name you could find for a bar. And then it must have been added onto somewhere along the line. Yeah. What What was it that made it so, why was it that people didn't want to go in? Why, why didn't the... Well, it the got so people? run down. Uh, originally, that's what I started to say, all the clubs meant there, you had a lot of different clubs in those days, card, U Ucra, I'm not sure what it is, but they met there once a week. 
all different clubs met there once a week. And if you were going to take anyone to a nice lunch and you went there. But that's when the Eckerts owned it. Now, not the same Eckerts that owned the parsonage. The Eckert girl is still about, she lives in the big white house next to the post, um, well, between the post office and the telephone company, yeah. When her started out with her grandparents, I believe, and then her parents, yeah. But once the guy, I can't think of his name, from Red Hook or so, then it went downhill. Yeah. I mean from top to bottom, the foundation, everything. You know? And they had bad fights in there, they were, and I don't know. There's rumors that sometimes years ago somebody got killed in there, but I can't verify that, so I don't know. No. But even in my day, I like I said, got out in fifty three. I don't remember any of the boys, and they all had their driver's license. I don't remember any of them going there. No? Because we had movies, see, in Hudson. There were all kind of movies to go to. Then pizza was really, really getting popular, and everybody would go for pizza later, and uh, the Columbia Diner after base after basketball games everybody that was coming south would race to get to the diner first because it would only really hold one school no no but I don't think kids today have as good a time as we did I really don't even though we had to work and I think that's a problem with kids today they don't have any they don't have anything to do. On a farm, you always had something to do. Yes, your grandfather. Always. Well, they had cows. But if you had fruit, it always was something to do. No. See, my father came to this country with foxes. Black and silver foxes. 1925 from Prince Edward Island in Canada. Uh, uh, two men from Tiv uh, Nevis, Nevis, Edgar Gerst and Dick Wilson, wanted to go in the fox business. Because at that time, for many, many years, Prince Edward Island had a pact with all the people that raised foxes. They would never sell a live pair only the pelts, the skins. And then somebody broke the pack and they sold the live hair and that was it. So then everybody started selling and the two men went up and my father's uncle was selling them. Well, then they needed somebody to build the fox ranch and teach them how to raise foxes. So that's how my father, they hired him. And then my mother was right from Nevis. So, they met. Now there's another building that's going all to pot. Then, um, Nevis Hotel. God, I'm sick. That used to be such a beautiful building. And a lot of the young girls worked there as waitresses. My mother worked there, yeah, you know, and I don't know, they keep trying to fix that up, but they're not making much progress. Mm -mm. So we, we like to end each interview with the same four questions so that we uh, can kind of have a, yeah. well, <laughs> just have a good, you know, base of the, yeah. the, the same. So the first question is, um, in your time, what has changed the most about Germantown for you? I think the people. I think the people, and maybe it's me, because I'm getting old, maybe it's me. I used to know everybody that lived on our road from Claremont to 9J. 
and when I, well, almost till the day I stopped teaching, the first day of school, I would have my kids write on a piece of paper who their next door neighbor was if they needed help. You can't imagine how people have no idea who they live next to. I don't know who lives over here. I know it's the locksmith from Hudson, but I don't know his name. Bartlotta's I know. But I don't know a lot of people on this road anymore. And I go and meet them. <laughs> I just go and make myself known and if they need anything, you know. That's one thing. What's the next question? Uh, what has stayed the same for you over the years? What's the constant? Oh, Lord. Well, maybe in a way it's the same answer, but it's the old people that I knew then, when I was a kid. They're still the same. But there again, maybe it's me. I don't know. The school has definitely changed. Oh, I can remember washing kids' mouths out with soap if they said the word damn. Ooh, would I be in trouble today? No. It's awful. They'll tell you. You look at them crossway, they say, Oh, I can sue you. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know what stayed the same. Certain people have stayed the same. Some of the organizations have stayed the same. Others have died out. But it just, I like to know who's here. And I know they want their privacy. I'm not going to bother their privacy. It's just nice to know who lives in your area. Yeah. Uh, what, um, what does Germantown mean to you? Oh, that's my home. I mean, I live in Livingston, but it's Germantown. I mean, my address is Germantown anyway, so... No, I I would never I You know what I really enjoy Nick is seeing kids that I taught when they were nine, eight, nine, ten years old, just little tots, and see what they've become. To me that is such a pleasure. And I wouldn't have that if I retired and went to Florida and I think I'm retired, I'm not sure. But anyway, maybe one day. <laughs> but what would I do? But anyway, no, I got kids that are have been prison guards and they're already retired. Now Eddie Moore, he's Hudson Police Chief. After retiring from the state troopers, young John Vale was um, oh he was whatever. Oh I love that kid. He was the prison guard. At Greenhaven or across the river there in Kuksaki, I'm not sure. But I love seeing going to Stewart's and once in a while the kids will come up, you know. I, to me, I like that. Other teachers don't, but I do. What do you hope for the future of Germantown? What, if you could pass on any ideals or more morals, what would you hope um, sticks? Well, I wish we could keep more of our young people here because we have so much talent in young people. A lot of grown-ups don't realize, and I don't think the kids realize until they get older what they could do. Oh, when I was a senior in high school, if any of my teachers had ever said, Oh, Mary, you're going to be a teacher, I would never have believed that. Then to study history and write a book, or two books, they never would have believed it. So you never know. You've got to watch these kids and get them going the best you can. And, and I don't think everybody has to go to college. No? No. I just, I hope it doesn't that's the only thing I have about people that move here. They, they move here because they like what we've got. But then they start to change it. They want what they left. You know? 
you know, I hope we don't ruin the land and all of that. But farmers are very careful now with what they can put on the trees and all. No. No. So I don't know if that answers your question That's or perfect. not. Perfect. Thank no. you very much. Really appreciate you sitting down and talking mm. with us. I don't know what you get out of that. <laughs> it's a lot of good information. That was great. I'm <laughs> still working. By the time my book comes out, I will know one way or another who built that central house. There you go. Sarah I, will uh, get the microphone yeah, from you. I have to avoid.